So loving those who are hard to love. So when we contemplate, when we think about individuals who we might find difficulty loving, really take the time to consider that. Take the time to consider how often they trigger you. So when you're finding someone that's hard to love, chances are it's not even that they're hard to love. It's just that they have the perfect combination of behavior, speech, <laughs> belief systems, and it all comes together and a perfect concoction of triggering your ego. Right. And so, but then when you're around people who are easy to love, again, chances are they're probably not triggering your ego all that much. And so that is the correspondence that we're looking at when it's coming to the, the loving easy or the, the, the loving challenges, if you will. And so let's take a breath. And I have my notes right here. And so I wrote this down a couple nights ago where I'm just like, although we can relish and mutual alignment with one another. And when I say alignment, it just means when things are just flowing. I'm sure we've all felt that before when you're with a friend or with a family member and it just flows effortlessly ever. So although we can relish in mutual alignment together, it's not necessarily our only, it's not necessarily our task to do. And I'm gonna share the Buddhist perception and I'm gonna share the Junisha perception. So in Buddhism, they have a vow, especially the monks take a vow, where it's to save all beings from suffering. Anyone heard that before? So in, in, in various Buddhist sects, part of, the, part of their vow is to make a commitment to save all beings from suffering. And in a lot of the Zen books I read that just that sentence just pops up again and again and again and again and again. And then although here in the West, whenever we talk about the word saving, it almost has a negative stigma to where it's like you're putting your muddy hand into someone else's water and then you're kind of murking it all up and whatnot. And so, but in the Buddhist sects, they, they don't really view it that way. They don't go out of their way to try and control other people's lives, but they recognize that by doing their mindfulness and their peace practice, the Zazen, the meditation, that that naturally helps elevate suffering within themselves. And when they themselves are not suffering, guess what? They're probably not spilling their suffering onto other people. And so that's a huge part of the importance of this work. In Junisha in Living Peace, we might take a vow, if we were gonna take a vow, um, which to wear a black robe, you do take some vows, but it's more associated with the continuous cultivation and embodiment of inner peace. And so it's just worded a little bit differently. And it's almost a vow to share a piece of your peace with everyone you come into contact with. And it still kind of designates a little bit of similarities there because when we're at peace, we're able to actually then share that peace. And when we're not at peace, what the, what the hell happens, right? You know, this week I got triggered a couple times. And when I was triggered a couple times, was I speaking beautifully and gracefully to the, the loved ones around me? <laughs> Not necessarily. The answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's, it's interesting, isn't it? And that's what's so fascinating is that the moment we get triggered, we just throw everything out. That's the time when we're not practicing, when it's the time that we really want to make sure that we're practicing the most. And then I was thinking about this. So, and I was reading this book, Joyfully Together, An Art of Building a Harmonious Community by Thich Nhat Hanh. And there's a lot in here, because um, it's all about how the monastics live together in a monastery. And there's a lot in here where they spend time really explaining how to love the difficult brother or sister in the monastery and how not to be cliquish about, you know, not to be cliquish with only, you know, liking one brother or sister because they're easy to get along with, but making sure that you are spending time equally with all individuals in the community and making sure that maybe even spending a little bit more time with the individuals who trigger you so that you can better understand their suffering and you can better understand where that trigger comes from. Because two things are happening when you're getting pissed off at someone or you're getting brushed up by that. Two things are happening. One, they're probably going through their own stuff. Maybe they're spilling their, their pain onto you. Maybe they're spilling their neurosis onto you. So that's 50% of it. They're in their own misalignment possibly. The other 50% is you probably have a bit of a karmic wound. When I say karma, I just mean a reoccurring thing that manifests in your life that just is like a thorn that scratches you. It's like 
every spring, you know, life returns and the weeds grow. <laughs> you have you have your field littered with those uh, weed seeds. And so the issue is not necessarily the the issue is not the seasons. The issue is that the seeds are already there ripe for growth. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And so it's your opportunity to take the time to dig them up and to pull them out mm -hmm. and then to maybe replant them with something else. And that really is what we're all about with the Living Peace Code. That's what a lot of Buddhist, um, Buddhist branches are about and mm -hmm. even other spiritual paths or religions or even just self-help avenues. A lot of it is about healing your shit. And well, let's just go ahead and take a deep breath. I can go on so many tangents, but sometimes it's best to just breathe. <laughs> Save them for another day. And so I was thinking about this, you know, if I could go back, I, I occasionally, and this is what's fascinating. When I read a lot of books on um, Zen masters or other Buddhist masters, what's fascinating is they often talk about the past. They're not dwelling on the past. But they go into the past for various stories and they reflect on how they could have done things in a more aligned way. And so that's the difference, you know, here to the untrained mind, we're constantly revisiting the past. Well, actually, the past is almost like it's constantly revisiting us because we're untrained in our mind. And so we may not be going into the past in a very specific, intentional way. We're going to the past because it's an unresolved wound. Does that make sense? Who's ever just been driving along and then boom, mental imaging hits you. And you're like, where the hell did that come from? I developed a practice years ago where I'd always find, I would follow the thought stream back to where the initial <laughs> thought that led me back into that memory. But that's neither here nor there. So every now and then I find, like I, I reflect on the past and I think about how I could have showed up more. And again, it's not about guilt. It's not about shame. It's just kind of cultivating that awareness so that in the future, if it manifests again, I could be more present. But like, I think even back to my high school days or elementary school days or middle school days with individuals, now that I realize even bullies that I recognize that were causing me harm or causing other people harm and recognizing now that they were deeply suffering. And I deeply, there's a couple individuals that every now and then pop in the mind. I'm like, and especially when I'm in meditation, I'm just holding space for that compassion, that love that I wish I could have. And again, I wish I could have not holding on to it, not attaching to it. It's just words for this sermon, but I wish I could have been more present for them. I wish I knew what I knew now so that I could have asked them a few questions that would have opened up different dialogue options. And then I think back to maybe my college times, and there's maybe a couple people there. And then I think back to my work and Earth Spirit Center for Healing and the first community that we built, and then the second community. And then there's just all these different people peppered throughout my life that had I been more firm in my peace, I probably would have responded differently. And I think that's a very humbling thing to recognize and to remember, even loved ones, even, even past boyfriends. <laughs> <laughs> past relationships you know there's different things that could have been handled differently and i think it's okay to contemplate this especially in a sacred space especially in a meditative space from time to time because that can help us then sure ourselves up later in the future does that make sense and what's beautiful in that scenario is that you're actually thinking about another person's well-being rather than yourself because a lot of times here's the fascinating thing about the savior complex a lot of, or when you're triggered, a lot of times when you think about other people, you're not really thinking about their well-being. You're thinking about how, what you can do to make them stop bothering you. <laughs> so it's really self-focused or what you can do to help them. But in your helping them, you actually get like ego gratification out of it. Who's a fixer, <laughs> right? And so again, you're not actually taking the time to ask them what their needs are. And that's a huge difference. So let's take a deep breath in. So that's a huge, uh, that's the difference between easy loving versus loving unconditionally. You know, when you're in a monastery and when you're taking time to understand another person's pain and you're cultivating that understanding, that is where the unconditional love comes from versus constantly just 
always gravitating towards the people who are easy to love. And here's the catch. Here's the number one thing. And maybe you can write this down. Let me see what I wrote down here. Learning to be firm within ourselves. Maybe write that under this section. Learning to be firm within ourselves. And when I say firm, it's kind of like that firm, that solid foundation. And when we are able to solidify that, it really drastically helps us be more stable, especially in living peace in Indonesia. We're really big on that emotional stability so that we can hold space for whatever whirlwind comes our way, whatever storm, tsunami, volcano, etc., forest fire, etc., drought, etc. <clears throat> I really like drought. That's a good one. Because think, who's ever been in a love spell? Uh, 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 what's that called? A dry spell. That's right. So who's ever been in like a love spell before? But that sounds interesting. You know what I mean? Okay. Who's ever been in a drought of love before where you're not receiving from maybe your partner, from your family, from your friends, and then you get all conditional about it? And then you start being sassy or you start being grouchy or you start being grumpy or you start being passive aggressive or you start being just fill in the blank. So that's conditional. Your behavior is based on the conditions on how moist the environment is <laughs> with love. <laughs> and unfortunately, that's not going to lead to a happy, a happy ending. It's not going to lead to a happy pathway of this life. And so that's why we have these teachings, these practices to get us through those times and to be the source, to <laughs> weird, my weird analogies, to be the, sor the source of moisture, <laughs> <laughs> to be the source of love and compassion and understanding in all environments, rather than waiting for it to meet your needs first. And again, that kind of goes back to the last week's sermon of releasing self initially. Hot bam. Okay, let's take the breath. So this is probably going to trigger some of you. It always seems to do. Anytime I bring up the love question and asking, beloved, how can I love you better? No one fucking does it. <laughs> <laughs> I've taught this to so many people over the years. And it's interesting how often people don't practice it. And it's because it's scary and it's, it's intimidating and it's challenging. And I think the number one thing of why we don't is because it's almost like we already feel exhausted. And so it's like, we don't want to go there with people because if we go there with people, then it's just going to be add another thing we have to worry about. But again, if we're feeling exhausted in that situation and we're feeling already triggered, or we already know what the other person's going to say, again, we're still attached to our own identity and we're still attached to ourself. And that's, that's the, that's the catch right there. But here's, I'm going to give you a softer version. You can maybe say, and maybe if you're very self-aware, where you could say, dear one, beloved, I know that I'm not meeting your needs or I'm not meeting your understanding or your appreciation right now. And I'm having a hard time and I may not be able to for a while because I'm struggling with my own things. You know, you're, you're disclaiming I'm struggling with my own things right now. So I, I'm aware that I'm not matching your needs, but I still want to take this opportunity to hear from you. I still want to take this opportunity to hear more of what is the cause of your own suffering. I want to get to know you a little better. And even just with that, you're opening up a deeper dialogue. And it's not even about being able to match each other's needs all the time or wants or desires. It's just cultivating a deeper understanding of each other's core wounding, if that makes sense. And creating a space where you can talk about it openly without judgment. And that alone is very healing. But let me go into this real quick. This is using children as the example. So in Plum Village, we often say that to love without knowing how to love wounds the person we love. Ooh, let me write that down. And this you can actually write down under the second bullet point, which is language of authority versus language of love. Language of authority versus language of love. So the quote was, to love without knowing how to love, comma, wounds the person we love. To love without knowing how to love, comma, wounds the person we love. <clears throat> Continuing on, and this is just going to go ahead and read it. The person we love may be our son or daughter, our wife or our husband. 
to truly love, the father can say to the child, my son, do you know that, my son, do you think that I understand you? Do you think that I understand your difficulties and your suffering? Please tell me. I want to know so that I can love you in such a way that does not hurt you. When a father says this, his son will have an opportunity to open his heart to the father. The same is true for a mother. A mother ha has to ask her daughter, darling, please tell me the truth. Do you think that I understand you? Do I understand your suffering, your difficulties, and your deepest wishes? If I do not yet understand, then please help me to understand. Because if I do not understand, I will continue to make you suffer in the name of love. This is what we call loving speech. Who has ever had an authority figure, such as a parental role, a teacher role, uh, just or guardian, or even a clergy? Anyone that's ever been in an authority role that is there to help guide you in some way that has hurt you. Right? And so, again, it's very difficult to go throughout this life without hurting people. But when we practice loving speech in this way, and we practice... When we, when we always make sure that we're marrying the concept of understanding and love, understanding and love, and then it, we're going to throw in peace as well for Dunisha. <laughs> when we marriage, mar when we do a trouble <laughs> of understanding love and peace, then it's going to really make sure and help us not to take these missteps that then cause others to harm more in love's name. Because a lot of, a lot of pain in this world comes from loving people. And we, it's, it's not even about love, it's about our attachments to what we want people, how we want people to behave, and how we want people to feel. We want people to complete us in a way that makes us further, makes us to feel further in alignment when we're with them, rather than feeling the discord. So let's take a breath. So that's all some juicy stuff. I'm, uh, our video is already getting pretty long, so I'm going to go ahead and jump to the third practice, third bullet point, which is the deathbed practice. Um, and that what I, I kind of built this around this week's song, which I heard for the first time this week. It's been out not too long, and I don't think most of you are probably going to enjoy the song and how it, it's one of the, that it's the, the modern, you know, like kind of rap, but not rap, and I don't know, I know some generations don't prefer it, and that's okay, um, but I picked it for the lyrics, and it's called Deathbed, and it actually, and you're going to hear the chorus is Coffee for Your Head, which is interesting, this guy heard that hook, and then he asked the creator of it to build this song, and he put it all together, and then he added the rap lyrics, and so Coffee for Your Head is by featuring B da doobie, <laughs> and then his name is Pofu. Already there, I'm sure the names trigger some of you, <laughs> but it just shows the cool generational differences. I love it. And so, not to generalize, not to project that, but sometimes I get words afterwards for the songs I pick. <laughs> That's happened all these years for the past decade. You should have been there for my Glee saga, where every freaking week I'd pick a Glee song. <laughs> anyway, okay, so the deathbed practice. And for those of you at home, you're welcome to look up that um, look up that song and then follow along on the handout if you want to later on. So, okay, deathbed practice. If you had a week left to live, what would you say? What would you do? Who would you want to see? So that's kind of the general. I'm sure we've all thought of that or heard of that before, but I'm going to take a little bit deeper. What unfinished business do you feel you would be leaving behind? So maybe write that question down. These, these next two questions are the ones I really want to bring home, and this can be your homework for the week. What unfinished business do you feel you would be leaving behind? And then the second one is, what unresolved karma? What unresolved karma? And again, when I say karma, I'm not necessarily meaning like law of attraction. I'm not meaning cause and effect, like you did something and then now you're being punished by God or the universe. That's not what it's about. When I talk about karma, I'm meaning repeated patterns 
or maybe you've, uh, so it could be two things, a repeated pattern within yourself that you did not get to heal this lifetime. So you notice that you just keep, it's just, there's this heaviness on your heart that you've not been able to release. Or maybe some harm that you did cause someone else. But it's not from divine judgment or anything like that. <clears throat> so really contemplate that. And that's what, when we take about five minutes of silence today, um, that's going to be, you're welcome to start that journaling practice if you want, or you can meditate with us. But this is going to be your, your week-long practice of what unfinished business would you be leaving behind and uh, what unresolved karma? And the reason why I ask these questions, even though it's dark and it's a time of a pandemic, the reason why I ask it is because it's so delicious and beautiful to think about on a daily basis, even if there wasn't a pandemic, because those, the answer to those two things might even take top priority in your life right now. Because if you're able to tackle those two things, tackle such a strong word. If you're able to make peace with those two things, think of how much more peace you're going to have for the rest of your life. Rather than putting them off, putting them off, putting them off, putting them off, putting them off. Who's ever put stuff off for years? <laughs> Emotional wounding. But if you're able to resolve it, take a really great year, get that therapy, <laughs> and just go all in. And maybe you have 20, 30, 40, 50 years left, 60 maybe. Think of how much more smoother that's going to be. And guess what? You're probably going to trip another time in the future. You might create more unfinished business. Or you might create more unresolved karma. But since you've really resolved some already, it's going to be easier to do the next one. And then the next one, the next one, because you're developing that discipline practice. Isn't that juicy? So let's breathe that in. Ah. <sighs> 